so it says it's live streaming service i hope that people are hearing us apart from my fellow panelists so welcome everybody this is um world population day the 11th of july 2020 and uh, my name is robin maynard and i'm the director of the campaigning charity population matters and welcome to population matters online panel discussion to mark world population day World Population Day was established by the UN Development Programme way back 30 years ago in 1989, which was pretty much the same time that I began uh, working as a, as a campaigner on environmental issues. Now, in 1989, the global population was 5.2 billion. Today, it's 7.8 billion. So there's been an increase of over 2.5 billion over the past three decades. And the UN projects that the global population is to reach 10 billion plus by 2030. So the focus of the theme for today is looking at the issue of population and how that affects the achievement of something called the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs for short. And those also originate from the, the UN. And that process was started way back. Um, some of you will remember the Earth Summit in 1992 but the current uh, SDGs, of which there are 17 Sustainable Development Goals, was adopted at the UN Sustainable Development Summit held in New York in 2015. I can promise you we're not going to go into detail on each and every one of the 17 SDGs or their 169 sub-targets, but rather we're going to use the UN's overarching intention of the SDGs to achieve decent lives for all on a healthy planet by 2030. That's going to be our sort of springboard. I'm afraid by the UN's own rather sobering assessment that on present progress, most of those 17 SDGs and those 169 targets are unlikely to be met. They're going to be missed and not achieved by 2030. So without further ado, joining me to discuss and explore the related issues of population and development are in alphabetical order. And panelists, you might just want to raise a hand as I introduce you. Uh, Wendo Azed, who is founder and director of Dandelion Africa, which he set up over 10 years ago and which works at the grassroots with marginalized rural communities in Kenya's Rift Valley, particularly empowering women and young people to be entrepreneurial, to meet the, the need, the unmet need and the demand for healthcare, including family planning. And Population Matters is very privileged to have supported Dandelion in, in a couple of recent projects. Uh, next, we go to uh, Kelly Dennings, who is population and sustainability campaigner for the uh, US Center for Biological Diversity. And Kelly's focus is on making the connections between population growth, consumption and threats to endangered species and their habitats. And I know, Kenny, that you, Kelly, that you've got a specialism and interest in behavior change for social good. And I really hope that that's something we'll explore in the, our discussions. Uh, Laurel Hanscom is the CEO of the Global Footprint Network. I think many people will know their work. They're the organization behind the widely known now and, and recognized concept of ecological footprinting. And um, you have your own World Day, Laurel. You've got Earth Overshoot Day coming up on uh, 22nd of August, I think. Is that right? That's great. Um, thank you. And that marks the day on which humanity, all of us, go into ecological deficit, i.e. we're drawing more on our planet's natural renewable resources than it can sustainably provide. Uh, finally, um, to Marie uh, Thakakara, who is an Indian writer, a regular contributor to the New Internationalist magazine, and a women's rights, women's rights act activist who's championing some of the most marginalized, deprived communities in India. And, and specifically, I'm, I'm aware of your work, Marie, on the, for the Balmikis, who are among the most repressed of India's Dalit or untouchable caste. So, I know I'm, you'll have a fantastic perspective in terms of, of India and people who are suffering some of the most inequitable um, uh, ratios on the planet. And your book, Endless Filth, I think deals particularly with that issue. So let us, let us open up the discussion and we're gonna have quite a free ranging discussion, but I just wanted to start off asking each of you uh, just to briefly reflect, given your area of work and experience, on how you feel about the progress of the UN's um, Sustainable Development Goals. Not all 17, obviously, but that overarching vision and aim to achieve decent lives for everyone on a healthy planet. I'm going to start in reverse order, but before I do, that's reverse alphabetical order, just a big welcome to all our uh, 
people who've joined us on Facebook. And if you've got comments, if you've got questions, fire them in and I will sort of pick them up at the side of my, of my screen where I'm, where I'm looking at the moment. And we'll try and introduce those into the conversation as well. So really, you know, great welcome to all of you from around the world. So, Marie, can I start with you? How, how do you feel about the SDGs and their progress and where we're heading? Something that might surprise most people would be the fact that India was the world's first country to begin a population control program way back in 1952. Yet we happen to be the second most populous country at 1.3 billion, which is absolutely shocking. We take up 2% of the world's land mass, yet we have 16% of the population. And the fact is, we simply aren't doing enough to control it despite almost desperate measures. By 1965, sterilization techniques for both men and women were introduced along with the copper tea. And I grew up surrounded by family planning notices and ads and everything. They also created an independent family planning department. But by 1976, the national policy was announced, raising the minimum marriage age for boys from 18 to 21 and for girls from 14 to 18. Illegal abortions, even up to seven months, were commonplace, even 40 years ago when I was a child. Uh, the forced sterilization phase in the mid 70s was of course an outrage and it toppled the then government. The burden of fewer children mostly falls on women and few men agree to vasectomies. They convinced it affects their masculinity, nor do they like using condoms. Many women who resort to sterilization are accused of sleeping around by their suspicious husbands. So when speaking to global audiences, I'm always struck by a sense of irony. The Indian government has pursued aggressive family planning from the 1970s. So on the one hand, India is incre incredibly progressive. Now, since January, this January, women have access to abortion till 24 weeks. Birth control tablets are fairly affordable and e easily available around the counter, over the counter. India's total fertility rate has been declining, even if it's not declining fast enough. Yet the fact is, even legal rights cannot overcome social and cultural barriers. Progressive laws or access to abortions cannot automatically guarantee empowerment. In my view, well, India's, Indian women don't get to decide whether, when, or how many children they want to have. Despite the ban on sex determination, many women are forced into unwanted abortions if the fetus isn't male. This, they often can't decide to access abortion or contraceptives. The use of condoms has declined by over 50% in the last decade and vasectomy rates have dropped too. Now, a separate uh, issue altogether is maternal health and mortality with rising unnecessary cesarean sections to make money on healthy urban women, alongside a C-section deficit among rural women who need it but can't access it. Murray, you've opened up, a, you've opened up the discussion brilliantly with a huge range of issues. Can I just hold you there and, and, and keep those thoughts? Because, because that's, that, that, there's so much in what you've, what you've already said. So um, I've made a few notes, but I'll be, I'll, most certainly we'll be coming back to you on that. Laurel, can I just, can I come to you next on that that sort of uh, just reflecting on, on what Marie said as well, but that uh, the dynamic between population issues and the achievement or otherwise of the SDGs? Absolutely, I mean, Marie. That is an extraordinary amount of information that I think we need some proper time to digest and 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 talk through. Um, at Global Footprint Network, we, as, as Robin mentioned, we mark Earth Overshoot Day, which is the day of the year that humanity has used up the planetary regenerative budget. Um, and this year, it, as you mentioned, it falls on August 22nd, which you didn't mention is last year, it was on July 29th, which is significant because COVID um, and the, the pandemic and the lockdown has, has pushed back that date by um, 
almost a month uh, in sort of an extraordinary situation for the world. Um, at Global Footprint Network, we think about our, our, our vision is a world where everyone can live well within the means of our ecological budget. Um, and so we truly believe that that can only happen through design, not by disasters like the current uh, global pandemic. Um, and we've thought a lot about the SDGs uh, since they, were, they came out um, in 2015. And in particular, because ecological footprint is one way of measuring um, sustain global sustainability or unsustainability in, in a certain sense. Um, and so we think of footprint, uh, uh, ecological footprint as this overarching measure to say whether or not we are living within the means of our planet. And if we're really serious about the SDGs, if we're really serious about sustainable development, that means that all of the, all of the, the lives that need to get better within the means of our planet um, must come much more rapidly than, than the work is, is, is happening. Um, a few years ago, uh, the, the Sustainable Development um, uh, the Solutions Network put together an SDG index that we thought was particularly interesting. And I think it highlights some of actually the shortcomings of the SDGs themselves. And essentially what they did was they, they quantified those 169 different um, target measures that support the 17 SDGs. Um, and then they ranked countries based on how well they performed on the data that are available. And they've updated their methodology several times in the last couple of years. But we were super interested in seeing how that worked out because as we looked at the SDGs from our, you know, our footprint perspective, we saw that uh, the environment was underrepresented um, in a lot of ways. Uh, we saw a lot of really great ideas and, and, and obviously beautiful things that we would like to see. The SDGs are an extraordinary achievement in terms of um, ideas for the international community. Um, but it also, we saw that there was sort of um, a, a big underperformance on sustainability uh, from an ecological and environmental perspective. Well, that is a perfect segue to go to Kelly, uh, Laurel, because I was just looking at, I've got my little chart of the SDGs to remind me of the 17 of them. And, and as you said, you know, two or three of them relate to life on earth other than ourselves, other than the human species to you know life on on land and life on the water etc and habitats kelly how, how 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 do you see it from the center of biological diversity's perspective yes well, well thank you robin for the invitation to speak um, so the center is a national nonprofit conservation organization dedicated to the protection of endangered species in wild places and we work through a combination of science the law organizing and creative media to protect wildlife and these wild places. And we say we want to win in the courts and in the court of public opinion. So as I was thinking about the center's different programs and the sustainable development goals, we, we have a lot of different teams within the center and we have an environmental health team that would work on like the number three good health and well-being. We have an oceans team that of, co of course clearly works on clean water and sanitation and the life below water. And we have a very new energy justice team that works on seven and 10, which would be affordable and clean energy and reduced inequality. And then our Climate Law Institute would work on 9 and 13, the industry innovation and infrastructure, and of course, climate action. And, you know, my program is one that's a little bit more uh, transdisciplinary, so I won't go through all of the ones that we work on, but we focus on both the consumption side of things and population. So I, I say that I like to work on family planning along with waste prevention, and it often confuses people. But so, um, you know, I just want to say because of when I thought about the progress that we're making towards the SDGs, you know, because of COVID-19 and of course here in the United States, the anti-racism movement, we have a renewed focus on equity and justice, which I think is one of the main components of the SDGs. And a light has been shown on the inability to have growth at any cost. So we see the issues associated with global supply chains and we feel the immediacy to build this circular economy. 
And more US people are now food insecure and face energy shutoffs and evictions. So people are struggling also to get sexual and reproductive health care especially within our black indigenous and people of color communities and in certain parts of the united states so we feel it's imperative that we support resiliency for individuals companies and communities going forward to be ready for the next pandemic or climate change and we need to build back better not go back to normal I'm seeing, which is brilliant, there are questions uh, firing in and comments always co already coming in from our, from our friends and, and uh, listeners out on, uh, and viewers out on Facebook. So it's so good to, to hear that. You're stimulating thought out there. And so welcome to those of you out on Facebook. You've joined Population Matters World Population Day live panel discussion on sustainability, the sustainable development goals issues related to population. So. Uh, Wendo, as it, I'm coming to you now. I, I mean, you work in rural Kenya with some pretty poor, marginalised communities, not benefiting from uh, from the uh, urban development and the infrastructure, etc. There, but also pretty hard pressed environmentally, but living there in 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 the rural environment. How how do you see this issue, and and what's your experience and perspective? Um, thank you very much, Robin. Um, I think that um, Kenya has made significant strides when it comes to the SDGs. Um, towards the end of last year, um, we were at 36%. Now, the government of Kenya, for example, came up with what they call the Big Four Agenda, which focuses on food and nutrition security, um, universal health coverage, affordable housing and manufacturing, all tailored to address most of the SDGs. Now, Dandelion Africa, the organization that I founded and I work with, focuses on rural women. And as you know, rural women are the key agents for development in any society. So Kenya, for example, most of the population live in rural areas. And women in rural areas play a catalytic role towards achieving sustainable development anywhere in the world, whether it's where Mary comes from, or even, you know, even in the UK, women play a very important role. But um, just like what Mary was saying, they, there's limited access to healthcare, there's limited access to education, there's limited access to credit for women to achieve their full potential. Now, in our organization, we've come up with different interventions because I am so passionate about making sure that women have every available um, resource to be able to be and prosper in every single way. So we take contraceptives door to door, village to village, um, to ensure that women have time for productive work so that they can come out of poverty. And I'm talking about marginalized rural women with no access and no information no awareness. Um, we do that through motorbikes. We have mobile outreaches, um, you know, any means possible to be able to deliver these very needed services to women. Now, poverty is being recycled in our communities. And that's because most of the time in rural communities, teenage pregnancies, early marriages, cultural practices like female genital mutilation is still rampant in our country, even though the government is doing a lot in making sure that these practices are criminalized. Now, ensuring that the girl child has education is not enough. So we do create opportunities for girls to go to school. But I think that one of the things that we might not be able to attain what we want in this country, especially when, when we're looking at SDGs, is the lack of involvement of men. I'm sorry, uh, Robin, uh, you know, we, we are always preaching to the choir. We talk to fellow women about contraceptives. We talk to fellow women about issues of empowerment but i can only get pregnant once a year like for to full time in reality you on the other hand can have i'm not gonna say 365 kids <laughs> but but that's the reality we need to be speaking and engaging not just engaging but men need to be um, very involved in issues of reproductive health not not in urban areas only in rural areas and in everyday life but they have to come in much earlier. I can't be talking to an old man of 70, yeah? I think that's uh, about, about contraceptives, right? No, I, I, we need to start from schools, Robin, right? So no, that is what we're doing. Down. Thank you. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling, I'm, feel, I'm shifting in my seat, as you can see, amongst, 
a group of, of, of powerful and, and empowered women. And, and I absolutely take your point. And I know you run a fantastic program, which Population Matters has helped modestly called Boys for Change. And we have to educate and enable boys and young men to make the change and not just, you know, in in any particular country, but globally. And I think, Murray, you raised this point yourself in your introductory comments, you know, that actually the, the pressure is on the women. And, and uh, how do we, you know, how, how do we ensure that this gets across? I mean, this, my next question was really, or thought was going to be about the blocks. And, and it seems sort of a, you know, low hanging fruit and a no brainer that there are nearly, you know, according to the UN, the 270 million women across the world who have an unmet need around choice over family planning and access and choice probably being the biggest word in some ways. And it's like, you know, that just seems so obvious. That's going to enable people to live the lives they want, make the choices they want. And it's a right, you know, and you've talked very strongly about rights, Murray, but it ain't happening fast enough, clearly. And I wonder, Murray, starting with you, what do you think would unlock and accelerate that? And please also, I've had a question in from, uh, I think it was Katrina, Katrina Velasco. Two good questions, one of which we might come on to later about the impacts of population growth, but particularly about how, let's look at the global north, because those of us who have children in the global north, and I'm in the UK, I've got two girls, you know, each of those girls and myself and my wife, our footprint, Laurel, is hugely heavier than somebody living in India or Niger or Kenya or wherever else. So we don't point fingers. We have to look at both these issues of consumption and population growth. Um, but I think just, Murray, can I just start with you on this? How, how can we enable people to, to have that unmet need dealt with in terms of the 270 women who don't have access to contraception without and we would never support anything like this going down the dark route that you raised around India's past on coercive practices. And we know similarly in China. I think the most uh, simple example that you could look at, which is really quite brilliant, is Kerala, where you hardly ever find families with more than one or two children. Where, and that all boils down to the fact that uh, there is education, 100% literacy, and women are educated as much as the men. Uh, whereas if you take our, center, our, con our, our states in the center of the country, which are the poorest states, uh, people have five, six children. And when we came here first, uh, tribal people, they, don't, they have small families as well. But many women uh, lost babies. Uh, every woman we met when we first came here, and we also had a, a, had a big health program, as a community health program, which led to the formation of a hospital. But because the women used to lose so many, each woman has had, has conceived and lost a child three times, four times before they finally get one or two. Now that's with tribal women. But I would say that it's so linked to education and the, as soon as people become lower middle class, they want more for their kids. They want better schools. They want everything for their kid to be better. And they don't have five or six children. That's very clear all over India. People only have very large families in the center of the country where they have and among the poor because that's the sort of security for their old age, for all the kids at 14 start working and bringing in money, etc. Whereas in Kerala, there's, there's no dropouts almost till they finish school at least and people go on to uh, university. So they don't, it's... It's so linked to education and women's education. Absolutely. Uh, Laurel, can I just turn to you on this? There's this sort of juxtaposition. It's one of the questions that's come in as well um, on the sort of footprint, feet print, you know, the, the, the weight of the foot and the number of the feet. I, do you get what, where, I'm, where I'm heading? And, and I mean, the, take, take, take us through that a little bit. Sure. So if we look at the growth of the ecological footprint over the last 50, 60 years, um, it shoots up as, as population shoots up. So um, we have in, you know, in, in countries that have a lot of wealth and a lot of consumption, uh, the population is also growing. And as we, as we look at these 
uh, simultaneously, um, we, we can see exactly how population factors into um, the, the equation, the literal equation impact is, is, is population affluence and technology. That was uh, a, an equation that was developed over 20 years, 30 years ago now, I guess. Um, and so it's important to think about all those three things together. So what the ecological footprint does um, is we look at those real numbers. And so we're looking at uh, the various factors that contribute to this overall imbalance between human demand and what the earth can regenerate. Uh, so I'm, I'm no expert in, in the, the levers of policy or, or cultural shift, but what I can say is that we can see very clearly in the data how population growth um, and projected population growth is going to have a massive impact um, on, the, on our ability to live and thrive on our one planet. So, uh, for example, uh, about 60% um, of, uh, or we've seen about 60% growth, right, uh, in terms of the footprint over that time period and, and, and similar levels. Um, but uh, what we also see is that by, by the end of this century, the, we have like a projection of over 11 billion, and that's the median projection, correct? For, if I can, I'll, I'll defer to the population experts on that. Um, and what that, what that means is that the more feet there are, the less there is to go around to each of us. And as we have seen time and time again, that means that those who are already marginalized, who are already disadvantaged, are the ones that are most impacted by the shrinking size of the pie as there are more feet on the ground. And population growth actually is something that is not a short-term solution, right? The short-term solution or the short-term impacts that come from um, the, the measures that, that uh, Wendo and Mari and Kelly are talking about are actually most beneficial at a social perspective. Population is a long-term game when we're looking at, at these statistics. And so if, for example, um, if the world adopted German, Japanese, Spanish, or Portuguese reproduction rates, uh, the world population by the end of the century would only be 4 billion. Um, and that's a lot more pie to go around when we're talking about uh, our ability to, to, to thrive and the natural resources required that are being produced and, and, and available sure. to support those. Sure, people. but, 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 but not if we continue consuming as we are. I mean, I think that's the real tension that right. the, the noble aim of the SDGs, which everybody in this discussion here wants to see is a greater number of people living, living well, living Absolutely. decent lives in a safe, planet but we also see these challenging statistics you know currently there are three whatever it is 3.5 billion high consumers in the world set to hit 5 billion plus and so as people develop they want more stuff so there's some major major challenges on all of us I just wanted to got a question in uh, from Chris Nellis who's uh, uh, an Eastern Orthodox theologian um, self-declared and and is very good question around leadership. And I want to put this to you, Wendo, because you were talking about cultural practices. And uh, we see across the world, you know, in, in uh, you know, not far from you in Tanzania, President Magafuli has said, yes, you know, women must have more children for economic growth. We have the same thing in Europe with Viktor Orban in Hungary and in Poland with Trump in the US and his base. Uh, you know, we have it with people in the, in, in the UK, etc. So the, what, what should we, you know, where are we going to get leadership outside, you know, our small organizations trying to do our bit and those who are, who are listening and watching in? What do you see as, you know, do you see leadership amongst religious cultural leaders in, in Kenya or is it a, is a real obstacle? I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm the right person to answer that on social media but I'm going to try to be polite. Thank you. Well, Wendy, don't worry. Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm landing all the questions, but I'm not answering myself. Um, I think as a country, I'm going to speak for Kenya because um, the challenges that we are facing are issues to do with gender ideology. 
where um, there are certain things that happen within the community that if it were the men folks, then it's not religious. But if it's women, then it tends to be religious. And these are some of the things contributing to the barriers towards attaining any of these SDGs. Now, if you talk about leadership, um, it's very, very, as I said, even in the beginning, it's very, very difficult to, I'm going to use these words because I have no better word to use. It's very difficult to teach an old cow new tricks. I don't even know if cows know to do any tricks, but that's, that's my point. So um, I, I found, for example, in our community where a leader comes in and tells the women in our community, don't listen to nonprofit organizations coming to talk to you about family planning, about reproductive health. Um, it is not in our culture. It is not religious. Women should not use contraceptives. However, the question I usually pose is you as a leader, how many children do you actually have? Do you have the 19, 20 children that you want others to have so that in 10, 15 or wannabe years, we can have more people to vote for a certain tribe? So um, I think that we have a tall order. And I also feel that because we don't have, as women, we don't have spaces where we can champion for our own issues, right? Most of these decisions and most of these policies are not being made by women. They are ma being made by people who don't own our bodies, who don't understand how we work, who don't understand the challenges of our reproductive rights. Um, and when you are talking about choice as well, um, it's very difficult for me to come to you and tell you, Robin, um, this is a cup of coffee. You can drink this cup of coffee. However, you need to walk 10 kilometers to come and drink this cup of coffee. I'll be like, okay, maybe the cup of coffee, coffee is going to do a lot of good to me. But when I come for the cup of coffee, the system doesn't quite work. There's nobody to show me how to drink the cup of coffee. There's nobody to show me how it is prepared. There's all these cultural myths around it created by our own leaders in the form of culture, in the form of religion. So I think that we have a long way to go. I'm not going to even talk about Mr. T because I can't bear to say his name. Um, I'm, all I'm just saying is that we need to advance more women so that we ourselves can talk about our own issues. We ourselves can develop products we ourselves can reduce the cost of contraceptives, as in condoms are free, Robin, come on. We have to buy contraceptives in our country. Women have to, if, if I earn only $2 a day, and then I have to buy contraceptives for $5, trust me, reproductive health will never be, will never be a, a, a priority for me. And that's the root cause of the problem. Policies, we talk about policies all the time, but in essence, I think we need action, yeah? Writing on paper is no longer enough for us and we just need action. Well, thank you. Thank you, Wendo. Um, Mary, I'm going to come to you just to follow up on that because I think that covered quite a lot of stuff that you, you talked about at the beginning. And just be before you do, um, just welcoming anybody who's joined us on this uh, live online panel discussion on World Population Day uh, hosted by Population Matters. We're looking at the Sustainable Development Goals, so those good things that we want to see of a better world with more people enjoying a higher quality of life and equity alongside the the pressures of population and of course consumption as well. Mari over to you. I think things in India have changed a lot for the better. Uh, I happen to live in the south and uh, there isn't as much poverty in the south as there is in the five states I mentioned before like Bihar, Madhya Pradesh, UP, Rajasthan, those are the states with the worst problems for women, the most maternal deaths. So uh, as for goals, we have the best legislation, we have laws and uh, family planning uh, programs are free. But at the end of the day, the women are not educated or even educated women can't always assert their rights. So it comes down to women having the power to say they don't want more kids, whether it means uh, contraception or whatever means. And that's the thing that in spite, in, except when women are educated and have some money of their own, it's hard for them to fight for anything for their rights. Does that answer? Thank you. 
Yes, it does. It does. And it, I was just, I, I, it's good because questions are popping in on the right bottom hand of my screen. And Kelly, this, there's one just come in following on from that. Uh, it's from um, Tom Harvey. His education open dialogues on these issues are, is so important, but how do you have productive discussions around population or overpopulation? Unlike many other environmental drivers, there seems to be a particular sensitivity around these issues. Spot on. I mean, Kelly, I think, to be honest, I think you're the only environmental organization I know who will talk openly about population. I mean, I used to work for Friends of the Earth and they won't. I work for the Wildlife Trust in the UK and they sort of do. WWF, the panda sort of puts a tentative paw in and then gets singed and retreats. How, you're brave, you're prepared to talk about it. We're, and don't we need to? Well, we do, I think so. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we definitely see um, that this impacts the work that we do due to habitat destruction, right? So it, um, the more people uh, has more agriculture, grazing, fossil fuel development, logging, urban sprawl, climate change, invasive species and pollution. So this fits right into the work that we do in trying to save habitat and, uh, and uh, species from extinction. So we understand that this is a stigmatized and sensitive topic. So about 11 years ago, we started a program called the Endangered Species Condoms as a way to open up this conversation with humor and with understanding. Perfect, Robin, thank you. Um, so there's actually two condoms inside the package and all of the packages have a threatened or endangered species noted on it uh, within North America that has been impacted by population growth. And we work to distribute them through zoos, museums, museums and aquariums, college campuses, other environmental groups, working with them to talk about this in a non-coercive human rights lens and helping them open up these conversations. So for us, we would never have enough condoms to, you know, really be providing access you know, in the way that a, a health clinic would. So we want to just have people plan their families, build a reproductive life plan, you know, talk about this with their partner and their healthcare provider and their families. And it's difficult, you know, th it's difficult in the United States, much less in, in other countries, I know. So hopefully the, the condoms help with that. And um, we, when we talk about behavior change, I know you kind of mentioned, Robin, this is one of my areas of expertise. You know, at the center, we focus not only on the individual having these conversations and providing them with information and resources to do that, but it's a systematic issue also. So, you know, even within the United States, we have issues around access. You know, it's, it's great to hear that you could go get birth control over the counter, you know, in India. We, we don't have that here and it's not free at all. That, that is not true either. And so there's um, still work to be done within the United States um, on access. And it's even all more all over the board when it comes to sex ed and comprehensive sex ed. So, you know, we have a lot of abstinence only programs within the United States um, that have been shown to increase teen pregnancies. And so the center works both on the policy level to overturn and, and, and provide support for family planning at the policy level, while also working to get individuals comfortable and in having these conversations with their partners. Brilliant. I mean, it's great to hear that. I mean, the, the, um, the so, yeah, absolutely. The work you're doing is, is so, is so positive. And I think it's, it, it's that, uh, that honesty to talk around the issue. You know, we, we find real difficulties talking with policymakers and, and politicians here in the UK and with colleagues in, in environmental NGOs. I mean, I have to say, I mean, that's why it's you know, lovely to work with and know uh, Wendo and, and now to have met you, Mari. I haven't had the same challenges talking with colleagues in, in Africa or India or Central America. It, it, there seems to be a much greater honesty and transparency and yeah this is this is one of the issues we have to deal with i mean you laurel you have some real challenges both of you kelly as well in the states we know that president trump i'm sorry to say his name wendo um but um you know he he reinstated what's known as the global gag whereas you know 
all US aid to any program across the world, development program, which has even a, you know, a whiff that abortion might be tolerated under any circumstances, has its funding withdrawn. And there's some pretty horrifying statistics from, I think it's the Guttmacher Institute talking about, you know, hundreds of thousands of unsafe abortions, thousands of maternal deaths, let alone the impact on those communities and their ability to develop. I mean, just be great to have a thought on that, Laura, where, where things are in the States and if there's a counter movement to try and unlock uh, those funds again. Well, I mean, we even see this week the Supreme Court decision um, in the U.S. that uh, essentially has made it possible for businesses to deny um, birth control to their employees if they have a religious objection. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's many layers of challenges, I think, in, in terms of policy. Um, unlike Kelly, uh, global, we, we don't work so much uh, at the policy level for population. Um, and uh, I will say that although population is one of the five solution pillars that we talk about, um, in terms of the, the, just the ways that we can um, change our long-term trends, uh, it, is, it is one that uh, is, is extraordinarily challenging to talk about. And it's, I honestly haven't quite figured out the best way to respond to people who really think this way uh, about population that it shouldn't be um, talked about because it's dangerous or harmful. And I think part of what's challenging about that is that it furthers this false notion that humans are somehow apart from nature. We're not apart from nature. We are a part of nature. Um, and everything we do, everything we consume, everything that we, all of the activities that we conduct, it's all part of the same system. And as we talk, think about the, you know, the current pandemic, I think that biological essence of who we are and how we relate to the planet becomes even more, um, and the inter interconnectedness of all of that becomes even more obvious. So as we try to think about how um, a, a population is part of the equation in the United States, uh, it's, 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 really, it's really a challenging to, to undo the, the stigma of that, that conversation. But I think, I mean, what, we, what we've learned is that we need to not take necessarily the, the role for ourselves in a global sense, but to listen to our colleagues like Wendo and Mari, to let them be leading that discussion. Let's not have this in an ivory tower. Let's not have this discussion, you know, at a at my this statistical theoretical level. Let's have this discussion. Um, start with people um, who are doing work on the ground, and and that's not me. I can I will support a hundred percent the work of. The, the women and, and men who are doing incredible work around the world to promote education for women and access to contraception and all kinds of other reproductive rights. Um, but I'm, I'm going to put, uh, I'm going to put that back, not to, to increase the burden. I will talk to other uh, people in my country and tell them, uh, you know, the effects, but I'm going to let Wendo and Mari lead this discussion um, because I really think that that's that's where this should brilliant. Should I mean, the, the questions are still coming in, and just to remind people who may have joined us, this is Population Matters World Population Day uh, discussion, looking at the sustainable the Sustainable Development Goals, which are seventeen aspirations for humanity to live better, more fairly, equitably on our planet and in in balance with other species, which are in pretty mortal danger of not being achieved. One of our, our um, uh, contributors from out there in the Facebook space has said, how, this is Corinne Bertrand, thank you very much. How come the fact that it is World Popula Population Day has not been mentioned once in the media? Oh my goodness, my job is getting harder by the day. And it is really interesting, you know, no, certainly in, in the UK and perhaps in the US as well, and across Europe, it's, population does not get the coverage it should. And yet, I, amongst the academic world, I mean, I was just thinking as you were all talking, you know, we know that enabling women and men to make positive informed choices is going to help them in terms of their entrepreneurial economic independence, 
contributing to their communities and to their national economies ultimately. But we also know that it makes a huge impact in terms of the environment. And I always try and raise the work of Project Drawdown, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with, where they just looked, the, the researchers looked at the top available solutions to climate change. And in short, they came out with initially that actually empowering women and girls, universal education plus family planning was the number one solution to reducing more carbon dioxide per annum than all onshore and offshore wind combined. They've slightly revised it down to be like it's just below food waste management, but it's still number two. And yet we don't hear anything from the environment groups about that. It seems really bizarre. And, you know, particularly, this is not about pointing fingers at people in developing countries having lots of children, because those of us in developed countries, each of our children has the greatest impact. And again, the, the research shows that the, the most effective environmental act you can do is to have one less child and we're trying to promote small families here in the UK but we're, we are sort of pushing against a, a real wall of resistance and um, so I just answered the question myself then because I got so so excited by that question coming in but I, there's something around and I, again maybe coming back to you following on Kelly you know we've had such good responses from Mary and Wendo about working in their in their countries and amongst their communities. But what is this sort of, this nudge that's needed to get people to go, it's okay, I can talk about this. This is not about being anti-people. This is not about hating children. This is not one about people wanting to die. This is about trying to make people's lives better. What, what is it? Is, is it something within our own species psyche that we can talk about every other species numbers, but not our own? Yeah, so, uh, so with my background in social and behavior change, one of the first things, one of the first tenets is to research, right? And so when I got to the center last year, we embarked on a large national survey that um, the ultimate goal is to build, we're kind of calling it a toolkit of sorts, but um, we want to be able to empower other environmental groups to talk about this and feel comfortable to talk about it. And so it's funny, I'll go to climate change conferences and they're familiar, my, my fellow colleagues in other environmental organizations are familiar with drawdown and they know that family planning and education of girls it, are two, top of the, two of the top 10 climate change solutions, but they just, they, they, they just either can't get management support, there's a whole bunch of barriers we can address that, that the center does want to do um, with, with our fellow NGOs in the environmental space. But, um, so we're going to have this toolkit soon, but one of the questions that we asked in this random survey was, how, what, what is your comfortability in talking about this? And actually 65, 55 to 60 percent of people felt comfortable, um, but of the people that didn't feel comfortable, they said that it was because it is a complex issue, and, and it can be complex. And so our goal over the next year here is to build um, resources and, and uh, tools for people to decrease this complexity. Now, whether that's, and this, this is right out of the behavior change book, you know, whether it's a nudge or a commitment strategy or appropriate framing or, um, you know, heuristics, you know, there are ways that we can, um, things that we can do to decrease the complexity of this and um, provide it to others, either in other environmental groups or, or individuals to talk about this again, you know, um, with, you know, getting over some of the indiscretions that have happened in the past, acknowledging them, um, but, but moving forward and discussing it with this human rights lens and, and showing that data. So more to come on that, but yeah, there's a lot of work from the behavior change side of things that we could do to, to work on this topic. Brilliant. Well, I look forward to that. Um, we're getting to sort of five, five to the hour of, of this uh, live panel discussion on World Population Day, looking at the so sustainable development goals and the population issue and factors around that. And I just wanted to ask each of our panelists, um, not necessarily closing, because we may have a bit more time, but, 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 but it's getting a wee bit tight. Just from our discussion so far, could you just give me each of you your sort of key takeaway point or thought and also just are you optimistic or pessimistic about 
delivering the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, over the next 10 years. Murray, I'm going to come to you first, if that's okay. Sure. I would say that in India, things have moved quite a bit. People, we don't see people starving, at least in the South anymore. We don't see families with five, with five ten children. And uh, education is a priority, even among very poor people. One of the things we'd have to deal with, for example, no matter how educated and empowered a woman is, what does she do when a drunken husband comes in and falls on top of her, to be rather crude? It's the kind of thing that we see a lot of. And I would say all of us, all, the, all of us who spoke here more or less felt that education and empowerment is important. And uh, I agree that we need to have the discussion out in the open. But having said that, in India, it's been out in the open for more than 50 years, even from the 70s, because even when I was a kid, these family planning stickers were on every bus, every bit of public transport. So having said that, I don't know whether if it hadn't been like that, we'd have had double our population. But I would say... Yeah, well, I, I mean, I do think that's impressive. I mean, the, the, the fertility rate in, in India is, what, 2.2, just over 2.2 your population isn't growing tremendously. I mean, there's a lot, a small percentage rate because make a big difference with large numbers, but I think fantastic progress. Wendo, what's your, what's your sort of takeaway from today's discussion and, you know, pessimistic, optimistic, glass half full, glass half empty, as we say <laughs> over here. <laughs> I, I am very optimistic because Kenya has made significant strides towards um, improving the lives and dignity of its people. Uh, we have pre-primary education, we have free maternal health. Um, the contraceptive prevalence has gone up from 46% to 58% in the last decade. That shows a significant improvement considering, you know, um, Kenya is, is a bit tricky. Um, but I also feel like there's so much much more that can be done. Um, for example, community-based distribution of contraceptives could, could actually work because majority of Kenya is rural. If women were able to access contraceptives at their point of need through community health workers um, in villages, I think we would be so, so much better. Lastly, as, and as you know, I'm, a, I'm an avid champion for men engagement when it comes to issues of women rights. I think that when we talk about choice, Gender equality is equals to choice, period. But that is not possible if we don't bring forth the men folks. Right from when they're young, when they're in school, they have to start being taught about the importance of reproductive health for all of us. Because as we always say, it is not about me as a woman and my reproductive rights only. When things go wrong with me as a woman in this community and in my household, it affects everybody. So we have to take a, a serious responsibility to educate the men folk. That way we won't have the leaders, the kind of leaders that we have with the sort of mentality that they do have. Thank yes. you, Wendo. Um, we're tight on time, but we started a bit late for technicality. So Laurel, over to you, please. Take a key takeaway and positive negative around SDGs achievement thereof oh, right. sorry big question <laughs> sorry <laughs> no pressure just 60 seconds to talk about this massive topic and how i feel about all of that and may i layer that with a, a global pandemic and the fact that my child is turning one this this month um so <laughs> i think that when i look at our data when i look at the work that we've done um over the last uh 20 30 years looking at ecological footprint it's been really, um, it's been really hard to get anyone to listen and, and look at these trends. And so it's very frustrating to have been having like having this narrative and the various versions of it, the different, um, some of which were very uh, negative and, and, and moralistic and, and, and honestly pretty uh, messed up in the past as, as Mari um, has communicated. Um, but where I do see a whole lot of hope um, in terms of our ability to maybe not achieve the SDGs, but to make real change in terms of um, access and progress and equity and, and justice is I see young people right now, men, women, US, UK, all like not limited to any part of the world. Um, I think this became very obvious during the Black Lives Matter 
uh, protests that are ongoing still in the United States. Um, the work of Gen X, as we call them in the US, but the work of the youth right now, uh, folks like Greta, folks uh, across the planet who are um, are talking about these things and, and understanding that this is about their lives. This gives me hope because I Brilliant. see them doing things that, that I never thought possible. And I've got a very quick supplementary for you, which is coming from Bob Bolland uh, or from Facebook. Um, he's asking, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase it because of the time. Uh, is it OK to talk about population growth uh, and shift the focus from consumption is that you know what, what he's actually saying is do you think that a western world focus on population growth diverts us from thinking about our own responsibility for first reducing our consumption i uh i you you tell me i i don't think uh i think it's a false dichotomy that you talk about one or the other that's a, it's 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 a it's a false dichotomy and it's a it's a logical trick that i think people try to put out there to force us into saying, oh no, this is more important. It's not one or the other. It's you have to talk about consumption and you have to talk about population and they go hand in hand and there are different solutions for different parts of the world. We're not homogenous and we need to recognize the important differences and the important challenges that, that different parts of the world face. Brilliant, Kelly, last but not least. Well, I wrote this down. I think it was Laurel who said it, uh, that we're looking for, um, we want to support this through design, not by disaster. And I think that the, the center really embodies that also. And I have the same kind of feelings and thoughts that Laurel's having, you know, global pandemic, the uh, anti-racist movement that's going on here in the United States. I feel that there is some true people power being built that will get us to where we need to be in the future. Perfect. Well, listen, thank you very much to all our panelists uh, for making this discussion so interesting and wide ranging. We could have gone on for a lot longer. This um, discussion is going to be recorded, so it'll be available on our, on our Population Matters website. And if you want to know more about our, our work on sustainable development goals and the report we've written about it, go to populationmatters.org forward slash SDGs. Um, so thank you very much, all of you. You've been participating and here in the panel and out there on the, on the ether, um, participating in Population Matters World Population Day, Population and Sustainable Development Goals discussion. It's been fascinating. And I really look forward to uh, working with all of all of you here on the panel and those of you who've contributed. Keep in touch with us at Population Matters and help us do our job better um, and have a good rest of your day, night and stay safe. Thank you very much indeed. Goodbye. <laughs>